Well, good morning, everybody. I want to talk to you this morning about, above all, the household of faith. And we're looking at Galatians chapter 6, and one of the verses that just jumps out from the page for me when I'm reading this particular scripture is, do good to all men, especially the household of faith. Now, the Greek word that's used here more often is interpreted rather than especially as above all, the household of faith. And we can sit there and we can ask the question and say, why doesn't it say do good above all to God or to Jesus or to the Holy Spirit? But the outworking of loving God is loving man. And just in case you didn't get it, you can hear it again over there. But the reality is this, is the outworking of loving God is loving each other. And especially those who sought to follow after his image. You see, all humankind was made in the image of God, but humanity fell from that image. Instead of seeing what was good in God's eyes, it saw what was good in its own eyes. And so often there's this battle going on between what we see as good and what we see as evil. And depending on who you speak to, you have a different outlook or perspective. But for us who believe in Jesus, our outlook, our perspective is tailored by a Heavenly Father who loves us so much, he gave us his only son. And in giving us his only son, there is a type that's set for us, that if we are his, we love to give. And we love to give generously, but especially to those who are our brothers and sisters. 1 Timothy 5, Verse 8 says this, and listen, if someone is not providing for his own relatives and especially his own household, then he is denying the faith and is worse off than an unbeliever. Wow. Hits you there, doesn't it? That the reality is if we don't practicalize love in the natural with our own household and our own family, if we neglect to care for those who we are related to, we're worse than an unbeliever. But how much more is that profound when we start to talk about those who are our spiritual brothers and sisters? And Paul starts off this very chapter with this notice, my spiritual brothers and sisters... Church is not a religion. Church is not a social club. Church is not a business. Church is not just here where you sing nice songs and you hear a nice message. Church is a family. We're called to relate to one another. And if you struggle with relating, you are not in the church. For relationship is the very calling that God has called you into. When he died on the cross, he died on the cross because he loved you. And desired a relationship with you. But if all you're about is moral ethics and moral practice and looking good and being religious and praying the right prayers and doing the right thing when people are looking at you, then you're all about falsehood and lies. For God wants you to be about relationship. He wants you to love. He wants you to care. The very first 
outpouring of sin and we see when it comes to Cain and Abel was that he did not care about his brother. He was, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer to that question, yes, you are. You are called to keep one another. You are called to strengthen one another. There's too many people out there who are accusers. There's too many people out there who are haters. There are too many people out there who are seeking to silence the voice of the church because they hate. They don't know what love is. So when you see a man who gave his life like Billy Graham to fiercely preach the gospel unapologetically about what Jesus had done on the cross, when they're tweeting his motorcade going down the motorway, you had so many people laughing. Welcome to hell, Billy. That's where you're going. This is the world. It hates the people of God. And so for the people of God need to understand, it calls on us much more so to love God's people. As he first loved us. We're not called to hate. We're called to be a people who love and love with extravagance. Unashamedly. My spiritual brothers and sisters, if one of our faithful has fallen into a trap and is snared by sin, don't stand idle and watch his demise. Gently restore him, being careful not to step into your own snare. I don't know about you, I sometimes like to watch YouTube clips where you see people falling. And they can often be the most uh, popular of clips. But we can spend too much time laughing at the expenses of people that we don't understand the damage it does to ourselves. What does it gain you if your success comes on the back of others? What does it gain you if your profit comes on the back of other people's misery. We are not called to be slavers. We are not called to be people who take advantage of people who are suffering. We are called to be people who take advantage of making people come into the joy of the Holy Spirit and the love of God. For God was a person who came and his priority was to lift up those who were sick, those who were weak. He said in his scriptures, I do not come for those who are healthy. I come as a physician to heal those who are poor of spirit, to take those who are suffering and to bring them so that they might love, know love and love to the fullness. Those who require somebody to be dependent on, I will be there for you. He is a rock. He will not cause you to sink. And yet so many times we as people can take rejoicing out of people's suffering. Whether it be to do with jealousy. Whether it be to be with self-ambition. Whether it be to be gaining something material from people. Whether it be to advance our own callings, our own burdens, our own desires. And God asks us, what about your brother? What about your sister? One of my favorite songs as a child at the age of 13 was, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. And the, the videos that you saw in this, of those who were suffering, who needed help. And yet you have a choice to help those who are helpless. 
This is what the Spirit is doing. When we talk about the Holy Spirit in the church, it is the voice of compassion for the lost. It is the voice of compassion for those who are suffering. It is the voice of compassion for those to lend their strength to those who are weak. But the priority is not just the material. The church in this day and age, put so much focus on the material and can sometimes stay silent on what is more important, the spiritual. What does it matter if I give somebody something to eat or drink if they're going to hell? What does it matter if I help them and clothe them because they were naked? If I don't tell them about the right clothing that they should be wearing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Do I see to a person's physical needs and ignore the spiritual? Do I take note that it's more popular to be somebody who is seen to be doing good on a material level and yet reject the spiritual? I do not want to come to the end of my days and find those people I could have had an influence on for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're standing at the precipice of judgment. And they might make a choice that means the difference between life and death. I want people to choose life and life to the full. And Paul's very concern here is that they choose life and life to the full. Do not neglect the spiritual. Do not fail to take responsibility, church, for what is sin and what is righteousness. Do not try to think that in your religiosity that you can be saved. It requires a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It requires a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do not fall into the trap of believing you can do it on your own because you cannot. Do not believe that what you promote is the gospel if you do not preach the cross of Jesus Christ. Do not believe that you are doing good if you are not giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no good sticking a plaster when somebody has got a mortal wound. That won't fix it. We can live in the security of thinking, oh, somebody is helping me. When in reality... They're not. They're just appeasing their own ego because they want to promote themselves over the person of Jesus Christ. Do not say that you are doing good if you do not give God the credit for that good that you are doing. If you give yourself the credit, then you will have to give an account for it before God. Tackle this weakness. Understand that this is a trap that you can fall into. Gently restore him, being careful not to step into your own snare. Shoulder each other's burdens, and then you will live as the law of the anointed teaches us. Don't take this opportunity to think that you are better than those who slip because you aren't. Then you become the fool and deceive even yourself. Examine your own works so that if you are proud, it will be because of your own accomplishments and not someone else's. Each person has his or her burden to bear and story to write. Do not blame others for your own failures, your own weaknesses what you have or what you don't have. 
you alone are to blame. Even in your situation, it doesn't matter what cards you were dealt with. It doesn't matter whether you are the have-nots or the haves. It doesn't matter whether you're in a relationship and your partner doesn't love you or whether they do love you. Only you can take responsibility for yourself. And this is what Paul is saying. Take responsibility for your own life that you might be saved. That you may know the Father. Make sure you have a relationship with the one who loves you. And trust in him to bring you through. And those who trust in him will be blessed. They will receive an inheritance. That inheritance is not necessarily in the here and now. It's an eternal inheritance. And there are many arguments over this, whether you can lose your salvation or whether you even had your salvation in the first place. Whether you're a Calvinist or an Armenian, the fact is this, take care of your own salvation. Doesn't matter what perspective you've seen of it, you alone have to give an account to the Lord. What did you do with your life? Did you sow it all into your selfishness? Or did you give to others? For those who sow into others will reap a reward. Those who sell into self have already reaped their reward. What you reap on earth, you won't reap in heaven. What you sow on earth, you will reap in heaven. We seem to forget that we are living in the age of the earth. This is the place where you bury. This is the place where you invest. This is the place where you take the time to prepare for a future. We haven't broken through to the fullness of life and life is to come. And that is the eternal life. When you die, you break the soil. You come out. And what you sow, what your root structure is, is the ability to provide life unto the next. You've invested in the good soil. Jesus Christ, then you will bear fruit in the next life. And Paul says, remember to share what you have with your mentor in the word. Make no, no mistake, God can't be mocked. What you give is what you get. What you sow, you harvest. Those who sow seeds in their flesh will only harvest destruction from their sinful nature. But those who sow seeds in the Spirit shall harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. May we never tire of doing what is good and right before our Lord, because in His season we shall bring in a great harvest if we can just persist. So seize any opportunity the Lord gives you to do good things and be a blessing to everyone especially those within our faithful family. Following in the path of the Spirit is not a chore. Instead, it opens us up to experiencing the life God has for us. Look at how giant these letters are now that I am writing with my own hand. So we have to tackle evil the burdens, the weaknesses within our own community help one another. We have to handle our pride, our ability to become selfish, our ability to invest in everything that's for our own nests and seek to go beyond to sharing the blessing with one another. Giving to those who teach us in the word. Why? Because they are investing in us those things which are spiritual. But it's more than the material giving. It's the dialogue of the soul. It's more than just the tithe. It's more than just the offerings. It's the dialogue. 
with the soul. That when you hear the word of God, you captivate it in your heart and in your soul and your body, your lifestyle replicates the fruit and the word that God has spoken. For when God spoke, he said, let there be light. And there was light. But what would have happened if the world or the earth hadn't responded to the word of God? There would have been darkness. What happens when we don't respond to the word of God that is taught to us? Is the light, is the revelation, or is the darkness, is the suffering? A lot of us are in dark places because we don't hear God's word. We hear the words of men. We hear the words of the world. We lose faith. We lose hope. But God is requiring us to share in the blessing of his word. Seizing the opportunity to bless someone. Turning the focus off your own needs and onto the needs of others. But above all, choosing to be prejudiced to the household of faith. You know, as a young man, what does it gain me if I bless people outside of my own family? but I'm nasty to those who are in it. Does a mother love her children more than any other children? Does a father love his children more than any other children? Well, the answer to this should be yes. We're not all born into families which this is unique in. We're not all having that experience. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will seek to do what God tells us to do. So even if you're in a family and there's a struggle going on in your family to love one another, you love them. You care for them. You be the one who is different. You be the discipler that will teach the difference. But don't just stop with your natural family. Do it for your spiritual. There's no good going outside in the world and helping those in the world while you're stabbing your brother in the back. Hypocrisy. You know, sometimes we can love certain people because they're more lovable than others. It's a simple fact. You know, it's a struggle sometimes to talk to some people because you're thinking, whoa, what got on their bandwagon? You know, their attitude stinks. Or they could be critical about you or somebody else and you're wanting to get them to encourage each other. But all they want to do is focus on the negative and God is turning around and saying, still love them anyway. Still care for them anyway. Because I love them. I care for them. And if you, if you show hate, you're not revealing who God is. In fact, actually you're walking down another path. Just like those people who were criticizing Billy Graham. We need to pray for their souls. For to call somebody who was a servant of God, a servant of the devil, it's a spirit of antichrist. It's the unforgivable sin. It's that idea of taking something which is precious and making it something which is not precious, the worst thing. Too many people are using their own faith as toilet paper. They're treating the people of God as if they're not worthy of the efforts. Jesus laid his life down for the church. 
Jesus laid his life down for your brothers and sisters. He gave you worth. He gave you meaning. Each one of us has worth because of he who laid his life down. Avoid those who find their identity in religion and not in relationship. The troublemakers who are putting pressure on you to be circumcised are trying to impress the flesh. They want to avoid the persecution that comes from preaching the cross of the anointed one, the liberating king. You want to please men? You want to be popular? You've got no business being a Christian. Because Jesus wasn't popular with, with the vast majority of people. They sought to persecute him. They sought his life. The very people he fed were the very people who were accusing him of blasphemy and seeking his life to be taken. Life is not about the popularity con contest. I thank God for this. Can you imagine what it's like at school? There's the popular clique. And then there's me. I wasn't so popular at school. And I thank God for that. Because we can fall into the danger of wanting to be liked and worshipped by other people. This is the burden, this is the trap that they're falling into. They're wanting to please the religious lot. Those who've got fancy words, those who've got the, the dress sense, those who've got the power. They're wanting to fit in. They're wanting to be fashionable. And yet they don't realize. It's like the emperor with no clothes. I mean, how often do you want to go to one of these fashion shows and say, what are you really wearing? It's a dustbin. It doesn't look right. You're all wrapped up in foil. Hey, <laughs> I do that to my pork. Put it in the oven. Wake up to the reality. Smell the coffee. The world doesn't have a clue. It seeks to make gods out of people. You know, whether it's presidents, whether it's kings, whether it's football players, whether it's models, all these people don't have the answer. They're fools. They've invested in the wrong kingdom. And God has called us to invest in his kingdom, his message. And an investment in his message can sometimes cause you trouble with those who seek to feather their own nests. They can point the finger. They can seek to judge you because you're saying what is right and they don't want to admit what is wrong. But even those who receive circumcision can't keep the law, although they think they can. And they hope to influence you which way you are to go with your own skin, so that they have bragging rights over your flesh. I can sometimes get concerned for church leaders when often the first thing they ask you is, how many people are in your congregation, bro? Success is not measured by how many people are in this church. I would rather have free people who were devoted to Jesus Christ than thousands of people who are only paying lip service. One person even. You know, remember the story of Abraham and Lot? And Abraham is sitting there and he's beseeching them and he's saying to them about Sodom and Gomorrah, Lord, don't pour down the fire on the city if there are so many righteous people there. There's one righteous man, Lot. God saves him. And yet the thousands are lost. 
And it's not about a popularity contest. Quality takes the precedence over quantity. God wants people to truly love him and get to know him. It's difficult preaching, uh, preferring the household or Christianity in this country because we have a mix-up understanding of what Christianity is. Only 55% of people in the UK who proclaim to be Christians believe in the God of the Bible. Only 23% of those people believe in some sort of higher power. 9% of UK Christians don't believe in anything. They're atheists. And 12% don't know what they believe in. Let me just say to you, we do not claim Christ. Christ claims us. And so many people are out there saying that they're Christians, but they don't know who Christ is because they've not been claimed by him. They sought to affiliate themselves with a religion, with a moral code, and yet do not believe in what the Bible represents or proclaims. They've not accepted the gospel of Christ they sought to make it into a religion. And in doing so, they're no better off than these troublemakers in Galatians. Paul gives the right way. Be the new creation that Christ has called you to be. May I never put anything above the cross of our Lord Jesus, the anointed. Through him, the world has been crucified to me and I to this world. Let me be clear. Circumcision won't save you. Uncircumcision won't either for that matter. So the way of religion and the way of the world will not save you. For both amount to nothing. God's new creation is what counts, and it counts for everything. You need to be born again. You need to ask God to create in you, to change you, to form you, to shape your life. And you may not know how to do that. It's as simple as opening the door and inviting him in. And you may be here this morning and you've practiced Christianity throughout your whole life. The morals, the codes. But you don't truly know who Jesus is. He's here in the form of his spirit. And all he's asking you to do is acknowledge that you've made a mess of your own life and allow him to take over your life to educate you, to disciple you. Discipleship does not come in the form of humanity discipling each other. Discipleship comes in the form of the Holy Spirit discipling us, us being sensitive to the voice of God that can sometimes speak through other people, but that can speak into your innermost soul when you're in times of reflection of him. All you have to do is ask Jesus into your life. And he will relate with you. He'll come a part of you. And he will teach you what matters to gain your salvation. May peace and mercy come to all of you who live by this rule and to the Israel of God. Now this was the biggest insult. What Paul is saying here is offensive to the Jew. It's offensive to the Gentile. He's saying that actually the true Israel are not those who are circumcised in the flesh, are not those who are religious. The true Israel are those who relate with God in a personal relationship. 
And they may be people who were in the past who were ethnically Jews or ethnically Israelites, but they are also ethnically Gentile. God has included those who seek to come into a relationship with him and call them his people, his household. In the future, don't let anyone cause trouble for me because I bear in my body the marks that wounded Jesus. Many of us suffer for what we believe. Many of us have been hurt for what we believe. I can hand on heart say I've been beaten up for, 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 for being a Christian. I can hand on heart say that I've witnessed people persecuting people because of what they believe. I can hand on heart know that it's difficult to be a Christian in this day and age and to stand up for what you believe when others seek to silence your voice. I know what it is to suffer for my faith. But I don't ask for people to avenge because I do not rely on the strength of people. I rely on the strength of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. That he is able to take even in the most difficult of suffering and keep me sane. Keep me in a position of comfort. He has prepared a table in the midst of my enemies that I might eat and be nourished. That I might know that he is with me when all else have forsaken me. I've been spat at. I've been laughed at. I've been punched at. I've had bottles smashed over my head. I've had friendships leave me and forsake me in my hour of need. I've had people who've been Christians who've dragged me down, not wanted to sit with me, not wanted to associate with me. I've done nothing but hurt me. But the reality is this, that I associate with God because of my suffering. That my identity comes because of my suffering. See, I know God because God suffered. A lot of people turn around and say, where is God with all this suffering? Hang on, he was on the cross. He suffered far worse than we've ever suffered. He identifies with us because we suffer. If you do not know what suffering is, you do not know who God is. And that's why it's easier for those who have suffered to come to know Jesus than those who have not suffered to come to know Jesus because to them, they are their own gods. Christ is the God of those who have suffered. He identifies with us in our suffering. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, infuse your spirit with his. Brothers and sisters, amen. Wouldn't you want that as your prayer, as your motto in life? That people will see God in you. In everything you do, in everything you say, in who that you are. That through his grace he's infused his Holy Spirit with you. So that you are being made new into his image continually, day by day, second by second. Too many people want to be like a celebrity. Too many people want to be the next football star. Too many people want to be the next Donald Trump. Too many people want to be the next Hillary Clinton or Jeremy Corbyn. Too many people want to be something which God has called them not to be. God wants to be with you. God wants you to be with him. It's as simple as that. When the gospel is all said and done, God wants you to be his friend. God wants you to be a part of the family. 
God wants us to love the family as he first loved us. Above all, humanity is God's family. Whether we choose to accept him as father or whether we choose not to accept him as father. He gives us the invitation anyway. He loves us regardless of whether we choose him or whether we don't choose him. But he chooses to give us the chance to live life and life to the full. Amen. Shall we stand?